Hello everyone, in this video I will be discussing data flow diagrams and specifically the elements of them. The learning objectives for this video are as follows. First, students should be able to explain the rules and style guidelines for data flow diagrams. And secondly, after watching all of this week's videos, you should be able to create data flow diagrams. Before we begin, here are a few key definitions. First, a process model is a formal way of representing how a business process operates. It illustrates activities that are performed and how data moves between them. A logical process model describes processes without suggesting how they are conducted. For example, without suggesting what kind of computer system this process will run on or whether it will be digitized at all. On the other hand, a physical process model does include process implementation information. This comes later in the design phase. For now, in the analysis phase, we develop logical process models and then we can update them later while we're in the design phase. Data flow diagramming is a popular technique for creating process models. Process models are not quite as popular as they used to be, but they are still used very frequently in industry, especially for those organizations that only use casual use cases instead of fully dressed, like we're doing this semester. Here's an example of a data flow diagram. This diagram is depicting the process of receiving a bill from a vendor and paying it. I'll use this example to show you what the different elements of a data flow diagram are. First, a process. Processes are represented with rounded rectangles or sometimes circles. A process is an activity or function performed for a specific business reason. These can be manual or computerized, and when you depict them on your diagram, you should include the following. A number, a name, which is usually a verb phrase, a description if necessary, and at least one output data flow, and at least one input data flow. Processes are the things that actually get done, taking some data and processing that data in some way, as you can see in the examples on the left. Logical process models omit any processes that simply move or route data and leave the data unchanged. But you should include logical processes that do the following performing computations like calculating a grade point average, making decisions like determining the availability of ordered products, sorting, filtering, or otherwise summarizing data like identifying overdue invoices, organizing data into useful information, triggering other processes like turning on the furnace or instructing a robot, or using stored data like creating, reading, updating, or deleting a record. Next we have data flows. These are the arrows that connect the different pieces on the data flow diagram. A data flow represents a single piece of data or a logical collection of data. Data flow names describe the content of the data flow, but not how it is implemented. It always starts or ends at a process. And it includes the following, a name and a description if necessary. It also includes one or more connections to a process. Two examples of data flows are shown on the left. Sometimes it's possible to have alternative data flows. This is where a process can produce different data flows given different conditions. You might remember in use cases, the normal course sometimes had alternative flows, and these are represented with alternative data flows and data flow diagrams. In this case, we show both data flows and use the process description to explain why they are alternatives. The third main DFD element is a data store. A data store is represented with an open, narrow rectangle, or even just listing the data store between two parallel lines. Most information systems capture data for later use. A data store, then, is a collection of data that is stored in some way. It could be a database or a particular table within a database. It could be a physical filing cabinet. On your diagram, you should include the following. A number, a name, a description if necessary, and one or more data flows, whether input or output or both. If data flows are in motion, think of data stores as data at rest. Often, data stores describe things about which the business wants to store data. The first example on the left is called chemical requests, because that is something about which the business wants to store data. This isn't always the case, but it's a good rule of thumb. Finally, we have external entities. An external entity is a person, organization, or another system that's external to the system that we're creating. It has interactions with the system by adding data to it or receiving data from it. On your diagram, you should include the following. A name and a description if necessary. 
Again, you can see examples on the left. The bottom example in each of these slides has depicted an element from the example I showed you at the beginning. You'll notice that on many of the previous slides I mentioned to include a description if necessary. Again, if the logic underlying the process is complex, more detail might be needed in the form of structured English, decision trees, or decision tables. We do not cover decision trees and decision tables in this class, but you can use structured English to provide more information about your data flow diagram. This can come in the form of footnotes, text boxes off to the side, or any other way that makes it clear. Now that you know the four main elements of a data flow diagram, you're ready to start putting them together.